or two minutes in and we're starting. Welcome to hosting events amidst a coronavirus. This is part of a large series. I'm Ray Wong, uh, Chris Wiles here at Constellation Research. We've got a number of analysts that are looking at how you can cope with the coronavirus. And we've got the series of Corona business, Corona business, ah, coronavirus biz hacks. I'm gonna say that like five times, coronavirus biz hacks. And, uh, and so, yeah, so you've probably seen the uh, earlier video, Brand Trust uh, in an Age of Fear and Virus. Uh, it was by Liz Miller. You can see the replay rights uh, that are there. Uh, definitely catch up there and understand what's going on and why brands are important. Special guest appearance with Nicole France. She jumped in at the end. And of course, yesterday's very, very popular webinar in terms of working from home, a guide to remote work during COVID-19. And so you can get a whole good idea of all the new latest tools, uh, latest programs, governance models, and Diane Hinchcliffe uh, is definitely uh, one of the leading thought leaders there. You might not know he's the guy that coined Enterprise 2.0, which Andrew McAfee and he actually went out and uh, started talking about. It. Okay, so where are we? We're talking about live events. And the challenge is we've been trying to figure out how to get live events to be successful. We've been honing this over the last four years, five years, six years to the point where, I mean, this is a huge part of the tech scene. It's a huge part of large events, uh, you know, creating community. It's a huge revenue model for event organizers. So whether you're an event organizer, organizer a vendor that actually throws a tech event, um, someone that actually brings a community together of professionals, um, you know, we're social by nature, right? This is why we all want to get together. And to say live events are going to go away, everything's going to be virtual. We went through that through SARS. We went through that through H1N1. The honest truth is nothing is better than doing something in person. Right? We can try to make virtual events very engaging. I can be really engaging like right now uh, to get your attention, right? but it's not the same. It's, it's, it's really the conversations on the side. It's that serendipity that actually happens when you bump into someone you haven't seen in a while. It's that decision to go out and get dinner with someone like, you know, on the fly. All those things are what craft um, a live event. So where are we right now? If you're looking here at a scene from one of our events, which is Constellation Connected Enterprise. You know, this is kind of our little fun dinner thing that we do at our event. Um, you know, where are we on live events? I think it's really important to understand that it's been cancellations, right? At this point, most live events have been canceled. Uh, if you were in the March timeframe or April timeframe, you probably didn't have as much time to retool to get to a virtual event. So most of those were either canceled or rescheduled. For a lot of events that have been um, holding their dates, um, they've been coming back as virtual events. Now, why? Nobody wants to be on the front page of the Wall Street Journal like, oh, we're the one that actually caused this event to spread. To be honest, look, you get the flu all the time. You get these infectious diseases. They could spread from multiple places. It's because this is new. Nobody wanted to be on the front of that paper. And if you're bad press and public health risks, oh, we're driving that. Now, the question right now is, well, what do we do about May and June? And there are a number of events that are actually still on because they're waiting it out. I'm sure they're waiting it out to the cancellation period. And um, the question is, how will they handle those events? But it's not those events you and I are worried about. It's about what happens in this post-coronavirus age, right? What happens when we have infectious diseases that spread out? And, and how do we prevent those, right? And I think that's important. But the state of the state at the moment is, look, if you proactively canceled an event, there's no policy or insurance policy that's going to cover your losses. People are waiting to the very end of that and of their contracts to see what happens. And then, of course, in the future going forward, you might wanna see if there are riders for communicable diseases. People are building out those policies today. So I just want people to know that that is available, that is actually happening uh, right now. Okay, so what's going on? There's still massive demand for events. You're looking at an Intel event here. Um, there's still massive demand for events, right? Because these are the drivers, these are the drivers that move deals, these are the drivers that build community, these are the drivers that, you know, Customers are basically looking for relationships, partnerships, our work, partners are working with each other. Um, and so this whole event business isn't gonna go away, right? The Coachellas of the world will still be there. We'll still have Olympics, maybe it'll be a year later, right? But it's the size of the events that's gonna determine some of the viability. We are still doing small dinners. Uh, people are getting together 10 to 15, 20 people. These are regional targeted city types of dinners. That's definitely not gonna go away. Those are the first that are gonna come back. We definitely see that, right? Events that are regional that are about 100, 150 people. I just spoke at a keynote. Uh, I won't say for whom, <laughs> actually, I can see on Twitter. Um, I, uh, literally on Wednesday. Uh, and, you know, 100 people showed up uh, in Chicago for an event. Right? Is it going to die down? Yes. Are we going to get to a point where we have to uh, limit our large events? Yes. But when we ramp up, you're going to see the small events pick up earlier. Um, and you're also going to see the large events 
and get planned out a little bit further out. And we actually see September, October being rescheduled for a lot of events from Oracle Open World uh, to you know, other events that are popping up. Um, we're seeing that pick up. So, so we think this is gonna pick up. We know this is gonna pick up. I don't even say think, we know this is going to pick up. And what's important is when we design these events, we should have four key principles here. We really should apply public health principles, making sure people are state, make, safe, making sure they put the right precautions. Our job also is because we're large events, we have a responsibility to think about how do we reduce disease transmission? What steps can we do to prevent a communicable disease, an infectious disease from passing on to each other? Uh, and then of course, we've got to figure out new event norms, right? So, I mean, I still like the handshake. I still give people big hugs, right? Maybe that goes away, right? Maybe we put a little footsie. Maybe we actually do air hugs or Ebola elbow bumps, right? Whatever happens, um, that's what's going to happen next. But there's new event norms and how we get together, right? Maybe at the beginning, we'll have a little bit more social distancing in lines or in buffets, right? But that's going to change. You're going to see people adjust to those behaviors. Uh, and then the more important thing is well, all, the goal should be about minimizing attendee risk. Now, you may have seen the blog post that started this conversation, which is really about what do you do in these events post coronavirus? I know we were jumping the gun. We didn't know what would happen if people are still gonna hold events and try to make it work, or they're gonna wait until later. Um, but let's start here. I mean, the first part that's important um, is really think about strict and precautionary tense policy restrictions, right? These are gonna be things when, hey, an outbreak occurs, makes sense. If you've been in that country within the period of time, don't invite people from there. Or if you're coming from there, work with local authorities um, to make sure that if there's a travel ban or not a travel ban, you self-impose a travel ban. So the idea here is to make sure that people who are attending the event are safe or at least knowledgeably do not um, intentionally try to pass a disease on. Like if you feel sick, don't come, right? Nobody wants you there, right? And that's, that's the point. Or if you feel sick, you don't, please don't hand that over to someone else. Um, Screening is also gonna be very, very important. We're gonna see screening in place. Um, we're also getting screening in terms of monitors, the way that you see those heat guns that actually occur in airports to see if you have a fever or a virus. Did you come from this area? We'll also see those actually um, being implemented at the event sites. Um, it's also about making it easy, right? I mean, people are not intentionally trying to sign up for an event and then cancel and then sign an event and then cancel, right? Cancellation policies, you can set them up. We've seen a lot of great examples where people have actually applied cancellation policies towards next year's event. People have given some refunds depending on what type of event business model they're in, right? And then that, that helps. Um, and of course, making sure people have flu-like symptoms don't come. Um, and yeah, if you've got questions also, please jump into the uh, Q&A. There's a Q&A bucket. So hop in on Zoom and ask those. Just wanna let people know, got a little ping thing. Uh, to do that. Uh, so the other piece that's important here is uh, thinking about, you know, what do you do for screenings, right? Um, what you're looking at here is a meeting I was at, uh, I would say, what was this, Tuesday night, right? This is a public meeting, right? I'm, I'm on the planning commission of my city. This is what social distancing looks like, <laughs> right? So, you know, um, it's very important, right, to make sure that there are cleaning processes in the venues. I think every venue that has been, that I've talked to, um, has established brand new types of cleaning processes. People are wiping down doors more. People are wiping down hand wheels. Uh, people are wiping down, you know, everything. You know, they're, they're providing hand sanitizers, masks. I walked out of this hotel this morning and someone handed me like two packets of alcohol wipes. Like I'm, I'm literally thinking like, hey, cool. Okay, what are these? He's like, oh yeah, just in case you need them, right? And so we're seeing these different things. We've got um, health advisories as well at event venues that are popping up. Um, and of course, you know, the no handshake policy keeps popping up everywhere. Um, but you're also going to want to conduct temperature screenings. And I think that's important because you want to make sure that if someone just happens to get the flu or something happens, there's a way to handle that. There's isolation rooms. The local public health authorities are more than welcome to, more than excited to work with you on this uh, to do something like that. Um, I was supposed to be speaking at an event in May in Singapore. The list of very interesting things and precautions that they had taken uh, was also eye-opening because they had quarantine rooms, isolation rooms. They had medical staff on site from the local public health authorities. You can definitely coordinate with each county if you're in the U.S. or local ministries, depending where you are around the world. Um, there's, a, there's a reception. People are open to doing that. Um, so what else? Well, I think what's important here to understand is um, having hand sanitizers and masks is, is, is more on the visual side, but there is a purpose here is because a lot of times people actually don't wash their hands. Um, yes, this, uh, this is actually at an event we saw on Wednesday. Um, actually, I think read, our, read the blog post, took some of the advice, um, had Purell right at the buffet line. Think about how many people's hands touched the buffet, right? Uh, and 
you know, they're buffet guards as well, making sure people actually didn't spit into the buffet or actually, you know, pass something on, right? And so we started to see these types of safety measures, not only in the food preparation, but also in the food delivery um, and having hand sanitization, like, a, you know, a Purell or any kind of like a dispenser right before you pick up food, I think is, is a great way to also minimize risks. Um, there's also uh, very interesting health checks. We've seen some interesting tools where people are asking attendees and exhibitors, like if you feel ill or if you want to check in your own health, um, we're seeing a little bit more uh, staffing of on-site medical professionals um, and also making sure that people have a place to kind of self-report, understand that they can check themselves in, be okay, and uh, help minimize that risk. Here's the thing, we've all been working really, really hard. People have been working, you know, burning the candle on both ends. And when you do that, you know, you're more susceptible for, for getting or catching uh, this kind of virus or getting any kind of communicable disease or wearing yourself down and becoming sick with a fever, right? And that's what people are trying to help uh, avoid. You also see changes as well in terms of staffing and staffing booths. I think some people have said, look, we don't want our people overworked. We don't want them to be more exposed than you know, eight, eight hour shifts, 10 hour shifts. Okay, that's fine. But the 14, 16 hours some people are doing, right? Let's, you know, let's put an end to that uh, if you can. I mean, some of these are volunteer provisions we're seeing. Uh, let's see. Okay, so, so then we basically come down to you know, the important part, which is really, what do we have to after the event, right? And, one of the things that we've never done at events, we do event surveys, but we never say, hey, do you feel okay, right? When you put out the event survey, one of the things that, you know, that is a great collection vehicle is to say, did you feel sick? Did you feel ill? Did something actually happen to you? And that actually helps because when, and, and some of you might know, I actually have a master's in public health. When you apply epidemiological data on a retrospective study, what, what is interesting is being able to analyze what were the critical factors, um, if it turns out that you're getting surveys where seven or eight people are all sick and you can actually isolate it to a hotel or to a venue or to a certain grouping of individuals, that might be the first indicator to help prevent an outbreak and also contain um, something that's actually viral. And I think it's a very, very useful data collection tool and very, very useful public health tool to get you there. Um, oops, sorry, sorry about that. Um, and then of course, uh, you know, prevent data, attendee data. You're gonna wanna have that available because a lot of people are gonna be asking for it and they're gonna wanna know um, post, what would you do? So, so we see that coming up. So that's kind of the broad picture of what's happening with events. Um, we have some other resources that are here um, that you should be seeing. These were some good resources in general um, for event planning, for event planners actually dealing with events. Uh, but, but I think the main thing to realize is that this is going to pick up. This is, um, we're going to go through some lulls. You're going to see things like a thousand cases in the US, which already passed, 10,000 cases, which is gonna happen sometime next week, right? We see a million people that are infected with the coronavirus, right? And then at some point you're gonna see case fatality rates drop because there's gonna be more broad testing, right? And once we have more broad testing, it won't be like, oh my God, 3% who got the coronavirus died, okay? That's gonna be bad. We're gonna get to something like 0.1%, 0.6%, um, depending on where we are. Um, and, and, and then we're gonna actually take precautions like we normally look at for the flu, but this is an infectious disease, right? Where we don't have a vaccine, this is an infectious disease. Um, we're gonna have other types of infectious diseases ripple through the events industry and, and basically we need to be prepared. And, and I think that's a very important thing for people to understand. So, so if you have an event in May or June, it's pretty likely that that may be, if we don't have quarantine measures in place, if we, we don't see lower cases, that most likely will become a virtual event. Um, we actually believe that most events will pick up again in August and September. And, and we actually think that that will be the height of the season as opposed to um, where we saw a lot of events being front loaded in the spring this year. So, so fall's gonna be very, very busy with events. So I think it's useful for everyone here to actually coordinate with each other on dates as well. Um, venues are, when I talk to some of the large venues in Las Vegas, large venues in Orlando, large venues in Nashville, um, large venues in um, you know, San Diego and, and uh, Seattle, uh, and LA and DC, they're, they're getting a lot of increase on moving existing events into September slots, October slots, all the way up into November. We're hoping that it will be better by then. So, so we do see that uh, popping up. Um, we got a question here. Uh, good friend, I, I don't know if I can put people in, but uh, I'll, I'll you know, answer this live. Um, so Scott Feldman, I agree with your points. Do you have any estimates on the increase in cost to large event producers to add the precautionary members on site, health rooms, on site nurses or doctors, addition of sanitary items? Um, I actually see those in two ways. One is yes, there's a minimal cost. Yeah, getting a full time physician and FTE on site might cost you something like ten, twenty thousand dollars for that kind of healthcare uh, in place. 
um, but that's okay. Um, the public health facilities will help partner with you on the health rooms. So I think that's very, very important. So you'll definitely see that. Uh, that's not the issue, but you might even get people to sponsor and sponsor the health clinic or the health rooms or even some of these areas. We're gonna see a lot of promotions pick up in the space where people say, hey, I like, I like to promote like the, the, the health room. I like to promote um, and you know, something that's you know, related to the physician on call that's on site. I like to provide you know, the health checks. Right? So you start seeing those types of promotions actually coming into place as people wanna associate their brand uh, with security and brand trust as well as, as Liz Miller talked about. So, cool. All right, so yeah, so fill in your questions. Uh, feel free to add questions that are here. Um, you know, we see these questions uh, open here. Let's see if there's other questions. Um, let's see, you've got chat. So some people are popping in here. So yeah, feel free to ask your questions, jump in. Um, this is what we see happening in this marketplace. Uh, we actually think that events will continue to go on for quite some time. Um, please don't be fearful of them. Uh, for a lot of folks, this is important for field marketing. It's important for what they do. Um, you know, I'd be, I'd be bad if I didn't plug our event as well. Uh, we actually have ours in October. Uh, we'll be putting a lot of these precautions in place for our events um, as well and working with the hotel and local authorities um, at the Ritz-Carlton and Half Moon Bay to do that. So you'll find that most of the hotel owners, general managers are more than willing to uh, work with you on that. Most of the hotels have been trained and alerted on what they need to do on this. And guess what? Look, planes are cleaner than ever. Trust me, I've never seen a plane that I fly this clean. And, and of course, uh, the hotels are cleaner than ever, but we'll see how long that, that lasts. Ah, we got another question here, pop them in. Uh, fantastic idea, turn this into a sponsorship, thank you. Uh, this is true, um, part of this is, uh, if you can do that, uh, I think it's very important. Um, you'll see new types of sponsorships emerge along the way. So with that, um, I'm gonna wait a little bit. If you've got questions, feel free to do this or you can send them direct to us at r at constellationr.com. Uh, let us know what's interesting to you. Uh, I'm checking other channels to see if other people are asking questions. Um, give me a second here. Let's see. We got a question from uh, Jay. Any ideas on what can be done to support the event management industry? All the small businesses in the contracts who form the backbone of our events. Uh, Jay Brodsky, thank you for that question. Um, uh, you know, at this moment in time, I think it's really thinking about where the smaller events are. I mean, there's going to be a lot of folks uh, unemployed for a little bit, uh, but hopefully if there's an end to this crisis, uh, hopefully three, four weeks out, people can pick it up again. But in the meantime, there's the virtual events business. And we actually see a lot of folks going to virtual events. It's really, they're doing the same level of, you know, there's same level of content, but different ways of producing the content. So virtual events, uh, virtual formats, um, people are still doing videos, webinars. Um, that's where you can help them as well. Uh, and then of course, you know, thinking about you know, it's hard to replace the venues, but uh, I had one idea. I haven't done this yet, but I'll share it with you guys. If you guys do it, please let me know you did it. Um, you know, so you have a great event, right? And as part of the event, like attendees are there. Imagine if you, you know, post made like lunch to all your attendees, right? And you have their addresses, they're willing to jump in and they all had lunch, right? And it was kind of like an open forum and lunch where people are getting together and you get live cams about people catching up, you know, different channels where you could actually have like, you know, birds of a feather type kind of conversations on like Zoom channels or, you know, Teams or Slack or wherever you are. Um, and, and I think that would be kind of fun, right? So, so you can have these interesting things where you actually have virtual lunch, support local businesses, you know, that would have had, you know, businesses near the convention that would have provided the food to go do something like that, which would be very fun. So definitely something there. Uh, when do you think live events will start returning? I actually think uh, the smaller ones are going to pick up. Anything under 100 will pick up probably in June, July. Um, I think people are going to be cabin fevered, um, so they're going to be wanting to get out and do stuff. Um, hopefully the health crisis and the public health implications are over at that point. And of course, the big events do take time to ramp up to get, you know, to get like four or 5,000 people together in a spot. I mean, you're going to need at least three months in advance to plan those. So you'll see those ones starting picking up in September, which is a great question. Ah, do you have a platform you prefer for virtual events? Um, that's a great question. Uh, I haven't found something I really like, but I believe you go to Diane's webinar, he can share with you. We actually saw some interesting things with, um, and, and people laugh, but take a look at Second Life. It actually got really, really good. And there's this other one that, I gotta go back and look at my tweet stream that we're evaluating that looked really good. Um, that was kind of much more interactive. Most people have tried on 24 virtual events. That can be done well. Um, it takes a lot of production to do that. And it takes a lot of effort to make sure you guide people through it. Um, but uh, but on 24 is, is, is one that we also see a lot that, that pops up. So definitely a great, great question there. 
I'm checking other Q and A. We got some more. Uh, yep, we've got one here. Thank you, Robbins. Uh, we got Scott, Scott, and cool. We got this answered. What else? Feel free to ask your questions. I know I wanted to do this fast. I know you guys don't have a lot of time, so I was trying to do this in, in 30 minutes. So, so you can all definitely get in, get out, and, and share your comments. Uh, one last thing, actually, when I think about it, there's a question that popped in here as well. That's a, that's a great question. Is what's the liability if someone gets sick at your event? Um, and what I think is, it's a really good question. Today, what is the liability if someone catches the flu or um, catches, you know, measles or catches something in play? And, and I think that's about to be established over time. For whatever reason, and I'm not saying and to diminish this to say this is like the flu, we have an infectious disease here. But for whatever reason, because we don't have a vaccine and this is brand new, we're in a weird shape, state of panic. It's a human nature to be panicked because we don't know what the answer is and what the outcome is going to be. And, and that's what's caused us to say, okay, who's liable? Who's, who's responsible for causing this? Did you intent, intent, intentionally like try to cause this transmission? I actually think if you put these precautions in place, um, that will re reduce your liability and your risk of liability. Um, and, and I think this is one of those things that people are going to ask for going forward. Um, as insurers think about events. So, so please definitely think about these measures, work with your insurance carriers, work with your legal teams, work with your risk mitigation uh, teams to make sure that some of these things are in place. And, and some of these are just common sense things we should have always done. We've just been a little bit cavalier about the flu over the last five to 10 years. Uh, great question, Becky. What do you think clients will care most about in a virtual session, both format and content? For example, shorter sessions, more panels, more focus on client stories. So, Let's break down like why we go to events, right? The keynotes are great. They've gone from like being very informative, like demos about the product, you know, customer stories to like straight out entertaining, like, oh, let's go find a best-selling author. Or let's go find like a celebrity to come in or let's find someone from Shark Tank, right? Or let's go bring in like a, a sports star to come visit, right? So, so, so they've become much more than where they started. I think in the virtual events, like that part goes away. You're not going to have that, that craziness, but you might have very interesting special interest interviews. Um, you might find ways to improve engagement where, you know, um, I actually, about three years ago, I was, at, I was in Australia and there was actually a very interesting event where it was, it was an unconference, but a virtual unconference. So part of it was you were there and the other part was virtual with other folks around the world. And what was interesting was the ability to create these brainstorming rooms where people get together, brainstorm ideas and still go back and present to each other. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to create a lot more facilitated sessions using the tools and helping to build communities along the way. Um, the challenge is really getting people to devote a day to actually do and be serious about this, right? So you could have the standard format where here's the keynote, here's what's going on, let's give you an overview. And then you give people mission and you say, look, at the end of the day, we're gonna have these presentations and we're gonna go around the world and we've got 20 slots and we're gonna compete to see which ideas are the best and the top 20 slots are gonna get a chance to present back to everybody, right? It's building that type of engagement, I think is gonna make what a virtual event be successful. Um, and so, Great question down here. Will you send out the recording of the event? Yes, I think they'll be available there. I think it's important. Um, it's there. Um, I won't mention who said this, but I think it's important. Uh, back to my point on liability. It is important because there is someone that's a legal professional that is here. Appreciate it. Is, um, if you exercise caution, due diligence, and reasonable practice methodologies, um, it mitigates most liability. So I, I think the caution and preparedness is key, and I do agree with um, that point. Anonymous, how can events best comply with privacy policies for attendees and still implement precautionary tactics such as temperature screens? Well, temperature screens are actually anonymous. It's just when you get pulled out. I mean, the question is, do they report you to the public health officials or not? So if you're running hot, uh, you know, that, that, I don't know what the privacy policy is when you step into a public forum. I believe the legal ruling is like if, you know, if, if, if you're at risk, people can take you out. Whether they call you out or not is a different story. So I, I don't know about that. But the data collection waivers on the back end is being able to track folks for epidemiological purposes. This person attend the event, right? Sometimes you have these things, which I really dislike, but they become very useful here. You'll see those RFID scans when you check into a room, especially uh, you'll see them on the C-Vent badges. Uh, they, they, they embed this little RFID chip to say, did they attend, did they not attend? That becomes actually very, very useful because it turns out you have an outbreak in room 2003 in the breakout session, and there were 72 people there. Then you tracked out another outbreak that happened in the you know, side hall, um, and then takes the same outbreak. You're gonna need that to do an epidemiological study. 
right? So, so that is very important. And I think that maybe some exceptions where data collection is going to move. So, um, let's see, what else do we have here? Uh, got that question, got that question. Wonderful. So we got your questions here. Keep popping questions. Aubrey is actually as well in the back, uh, popping in questions from other folks. Uh, from an honest attendee, did Diane's present include tips on virtual event platforms as well as home office productivity? Short answer is yes. How can events best comply? We got that. What else? Um, yep. So yeah, so yeah, that's about where we are on the questions. Thank you, Aubrey, our, our awesome producer on Disrupt TV as well, and uh, runs our marketing uh, here at Constellation Research. So um, yeah, so that's about it. Uh, I'm gonna leave about three more minutes, pop in your questions, feel free to write, hit me up on Twitter. Um, everybody on team's happy to help. Uh, I think it's, um, as you convert, as you convert back from virtual events to live events, I think there's gonna be some interesting learnings. Please incorporate a virtual event option um, for your live events. I think that's also very useful in, in uh, tracking what events were interesting, what topics were interesting, and provide you a good signal for your digital marketing efforts as well. So, so definitely there. Um, and yeah, we will share the video later today um, through all our normal Constellation research channels. Uh, you'll see it on Twitter, you'll see it on LinkedIn. Of course, I, I think we have a Facebook page actually, which we don't use much, that will be out there as well. And of course, uh, you'll see us on our, our Vimeo page. So definitely see that there. Um, and maybe it becomes a podcast, uh, which we do have as well. So that's about it. Uh, one last tip, I guess. Oh, that's a good point. Uh, also YouTube, so a good point here. One last tip actually is very important with, as we get back to these events, I think that you're going to see a reduction in travel budgets. And here's why, because when we ramp the economy down in this lockdown that people are trying to do to contain the virus, what's gonna happen is it's gonna take a little bit longer to ramp up all these things that we normally have. So folks having travel budgets, being able to attend events, all the training, because there's a pressure from uh, the markets at this point on, hey, will the revenue be there? And so all this momentum that we've built over the last five years, um, it's gonna slow down a little. So, so just, you may have fewer events, but they're gonna be better events. You may have smaller events, they're gonna be more high quality. And so one of the things that's gonna shift is that you're gonna go after more targeted communities for those events. And it's not gonna be the big, wide ranging events that we used to. It's gonna get harder to do this the longer um, this lockdown occurs and the longer that we actually don't have a resolution to where we are in terms of these coronavirus measures and, and what actually happens uh, in terms of rate of transmissions. So, so this thing drags out to June, July, you're gonna have much smaller events and it's gonna take a long time to wrap. If this thing, we get a resolution by May or June, I think we'll be close to 80% of where we are. So definitely a great question from someone there. All right, thank you so much for your time. I uh, wanted to keep it short, uh, like any other virtual event. Uh, and uh, please feel free to drop in with your comments, share the video with anyone. So if it's uh, out there, please you know, share that with as many people as you can. We hope people get back to getting to live events, very important part of economy. Uh, we don't need any more big shutdowns like South by Southwest and Coachella uh, to impact businesses, uh, impact cities and neighborhoods. I, I think it's gonna take a hit on the economies for a lot of folks. And uh, hopefully we get a resolution to where we are in terms of the coronavirus, as well as any future infectious diseases. This is really important. This is preparing you for the future uh, once we get out of where we are today. Thanks again. I'm Ray Wong with Constellation Research, and uh, thank you for being on this uh, webinar. Thank you.